Welcome to Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I'm your host, Levi Strom. On today's episode, I speak with Chelsea Dudgeon, founder and CEO of Newell's Botanicals, about how her homegrown medical garden turned into an award-winning craft cannabis brand. I got I got obsessed with cannabis, like once I kind of discovered all of its magical properties. Um, and I was I would take any opportunity that I could to just be hands on the plant. Mm-hmm. Um, did a lot of work in gardens for free or for for a couple bowls um just to get the skills uh and know what I was fucking talking about like I, I did a lot <laughs> um and so, so when when I made the the formula for deep skin it, there was no mules botanicals um I had no no thought or interest in like starting a brand that was not the goal um <clears throat> I had a dope garden though it was the first time that I had like my own plants that I was growing myself and you know that's all new like he let me move into his house and he let me work the garden um and because he's he can grow like he can grow too but he just stepped aside and let me fucking play mm-hmm. I was we were growing all kinds of stuff um weed and, and calendula and chamomile I had all these things growing and while I was growing them I was also researching you know by the different compounds in the plants that, that make them function um Newell is a super spiritual like hippie dude he's got these bookshelves just chock full of esoteric reading and herbalism I was soaking all this info up and you know he's a data bank <laughs> you have a yeah. a knows organic chemistry like even if he's not familiar with particular compound or or whatever if I walk him through my problem it it helps to solve it like he has the insight to like work out the kinks so I, I remember at one point we were we were doing a lot of conversing and reading and and YouTube watching on the subject of uh like endogenous steroids like cholesterol um and I was my grandma at the time was also dealing with a lot of issues with the medical system she was recovering from you know a heart attack a couple years previous uh she had a hip replacement she had to have I think knee surgery or something like that or maybe her leg was just broken because somebody fell on her Mm. she was having issues and she she doesn't like doctors and she doesn't like pills and medications and she is from that generation of like waif thin like 110 pounds soaking wet like if you can see something other than my bones i'm fat like Mm. and so she was not she was (laughs) a healthy person in general who was like starving herself of nutrients Mm. oh i drink my green drink in the morning i'm like man that's not enough food for the whole day (laughs) (laughs) um she's probably really active too right (laughs) oh yeah super active super active she hurt constantly uh, moving back then she was still a house cleaner house and office cleaner Mm -hmm. in her office um thankfully she's now retired to chasing little dogs around her house (laughs) but uh i i really wanted to get some cholesterol in her is the point because Mm -hmm. like endogenous steroid it really reduces inflammation it helps speed healing it would have dealt with a lot of the issues she was dealing with but i could not get her to eat it Mm. and i'm emo oil emo oil is like pure cholesterol because it's Mm -hmm. an animal Mm -hmm. it's for And even though I couldn't get into her systemically, at least I could get cholesterol to the knee area Mm -hmm. or to the, and that would help. Hmm. I also knew like in the back of my mind, I knew because I had worked on this hippies garden this one time and he had a blue emu jar 
that he had just dumped Keith into, mm -hmm. I knew it was a good carrier for cannabis. Mm -hmm. And so I just started stacking on the good. I pulled the calendula out of the garden. I threw that in there and I grabbed the chamomile and I threw that in. I just put in whatever I had. And I didn't really know. I didn't know for sure what all these different properties were. Some of that info I learned after I had already made it. Mm -hmm. When I, why is this working so well? Um, but that was that was the approach. I was just trying to like deal with my grandma's inflammation from ten different directions. Mm -hmm. And did it help? Obviously, it did. Obviously, Talk about that experience. It helped. Um, and the jar that you know, <clears throat> the jar that I had poured her bottles out of, I still had it when the Emerald Cup rolled around, and I wanted a VIP pass. Right like that was it that was my reasoning like I had put in some of my homegrown flowers for one ticket mm -hmm. but two so I was just like let's do the topical and I I got like these dumb little round stickers off of you know like vista print and I made up a stupid name like the night before I don't know it, yeah it, it, it did itself this is something that just like happened to me I, I wasn't involved and that was 2016. Is that right? Was. Yeah. 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 I remember that year. I had won first place in topicals in 2015. And then you guys won first place the next year. And I think you've won first place just about every year since then. Huh. But that, well, you've done quite well. Um, but I, you know, bunch of cool shit and what you just said. I mean, one, you know, you kind of it's like you you were growing all the herbs yourself and it parallels so much of my story too and and like just you, you had your like your little lab garden like you're doing like real clinical like research kind of you know just in your garden and, and infusing these herbs directly into carrier oils which you can do right at home which turns out is like the best extraction method on the planet um because it really infuses the whole plant and just doing you know straining it with some cheese cloth you know these are things that people can literally do at home with a mason jar and some herbs and a windowsill and you know emu oil is is really interesting i didn't know that cholesterol I lost you, Levi. can you hear me now got me uh, yeah i'll have to i'll have to talk really slow <laughs> um <clears throat> but anyway I, I was just unpacking um, some of the things that you said, and I didn't know cholesterol helped topically. How does that work? You said cholesterol is an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Uh, well, the it it basically mimics the phospholipid bilayer on your cells, which is why it's able to get really deep into tissues. It's like those berries. Um, <clears throat> and and so yeah it doesn't stay topical i guess is the point it it gotcha. goes through the tissue and, and everything really fast gotcha. so it's a it's it's penetrating abilities that um that allows it to carry other active ingredients yeah to, the, to other the source it itself. like the cannabinoids and terpenes it it's an endogenous steroid, so okay. it, it does um, the inflammatory cytokines, I believe they're called. Gotcha. So emu oil on its own mm -hmm. is an analgesic anti-inflammatory topically. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so you kind of just through trial and error and you had your grandmother and her knee to kind of like see the results in real time, which is a huge advantage. You know, I, I had my neck, you know, it was like I pay, being patient zero really helps you kind of speed up the formulation process. And it's like that kind of R and D that like that you did that I think a lot of people skip, you know, and they just think, Oh, just whatever, you know, just like, it doesn't matter, but I think the formulation is so important because I think natural products when they're formulated correctly are just as good and honestly better than most synthetic, you know, we know they're better, 
but we need good formulas. And it's like the better we can be as formulators, um, the better these products are going to be, the more people are going to use them, the less people will need these harmful, addictive synthetics from the pharmaceutical industry. It's like the role of formulator is so important. Um, and you're, so you've won the Emerald cup five times. Is that correct? Four times, four, four, four times, but first place topicals for four years in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't end the most recent one. Right. Yeah. Same, but that's an impressive streak. And that certainly, I think showcases your ability, um, to make products that, that really work, um, that, that, um, more people need to try, um, you know, like I said, I, I, your deep skin, that roll on has been my favorite topical product, um, for, you know, my rib and, and the rib pain that it's really deep and really hard for most topicals to get to. Yeah. Um, so the knowledge, the knowledge you have, you're applying that outside of cannabis. Now I know a little bit to the mushroom space and, um, I want to definitely pick your brain a little bit about mushroom formulation, because I know that you're probably reading about that and you're, are you growing mushrooms? Like where, where are you in that process right now? I have grown mushrooms, but my home environment is not clean enough to mm -hmm. sustain a mushroom grow. Right. I, I hear a lot of microbes in the open air in this fucking space. <laughs> it's really good for you dirty hippies yeah pretty much pretty dirty hippies all the five dogs running in and out of the house all the time i was not able to keep a, a culture clean long enough to really grow mushrooms um but i learned the steps so at least now i'm informed mm -hmm. you know i've done it <clears throat> uh and then when it comes to formulation it's like we're talking about the brain and it's nowhere near as straightforward as the endocannabinoid system so it's, it's not easy. I worry about harming people. And I mean, that's why I really only focus on microdoses because if someone, if someone's brain is set up differently and they have a bad reaction to it, at least it's tiny. Right. The mushroom was, it's, it does. It gives me a little bit more stress because I feel like I don't have access to the level of information that, that we need. I would love to actually be able to profile the mushrooms before I incorporate them in something. I are really you, are you lab testing? No. Do you know of labs that can test for psilocybin and psilocybin? Not, I don't. Um, and I'm nervous to even ask. Okay. I'm but, not. I'll ask for you. Um right. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to find one for myself so I can take so I can lab test my medicine if I decide to eat some mushrooms. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that. I know I I know there are labs that can do it. It's just about finding the right standard. So if they can, and I know they have psilocybin standards available um, for these accredited labs to access. So I'm gonna look into that, Chelsea. Listen, there's like two different equally psychoactive. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to understand more about that. I don't right now. Um, so what is a microdose of mushroom? Like what's the milligrams that is considered a microdose? It's like a quarter gram ish. I usually go under that though. Like for mm -hmm. me, a quarter gram microdose. Um, so when I, when I blitz it up, powder it down, I mix in citric acid. It helps to kind of like ease the digestive process. <laughs> It makes it makes the things more bioavailable quicker because mm -hmm. um, your stomach acid alone doesn't quite do the job. It's a different kind of acid. Mm -hmm. um, the where I, where was I going with that? Oh, it makes it so where it's kind of potent. Like you get the full dose of the medicine faster instead of having it like trickle through your intestines over time gotcha so like the the full amount hits you up front exactly and so from i'm extremely sensitive to psilocybin um and so for me a quarter gram would actually make me like uncomfortable mm -hmm. um it's 
you know when you're taking like a, a macro dose what before it peaks that kind of like scary onto your seat feeling mm-hmm. sure it, it's like uh oh strap in here we go it was kind of being like that for like four hours mm-hmm. and so scaled back down to like 100 milligrams 150 milligrams and that's kind of my sweet spot i've also done gummies where um i don't know why the gummies hit harder faster stronger it might be because i actually cooked them down with like a whole ass lemon <laughs> hmm. super processed but i've had gummies that only had about 50 milligrams in them and i got the full microdose from that so it really hmm. depends and that's really when I started like combining them with other things. That was that was a lion's mane, you know, niacin, psilocybin gummy with lemons, and it just kicked my ass. <laughs> Do mushrooms have any topical application that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. I was curious about that. I know from talking to patients working with patients like we all have over the years that I have a handful of patients older that swear by magic mushrooms for their arthritis. Like, like people that ingesting mushrooms, not topically ingesting them that, you know, say that it, you know, it opens up their crippling arthritis to where they have full mobility for an entire day. Neurotransmitters do a lot more in the body than just work run around your brain mm-hmm. and <clears throat> the effect of psilocybin in a normal brain which probably only like 60 percent of people actually have a it normal just, brain there's there's our clip this is this is going to be a clip <laughs> so it just causes you to make more dopamine and more serotonin you just have more of everything and okay. a lot, they run around your whole nervous system it's not just localized here <laughs> So I can definitely see how that would be the case. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of potential for mushrooms in the body for inflammation and these kind of you know chronic you know arthritis. I've always viewed arthritis as like an energy disease. Um, it's just like there's an energy blockage. You know, things need to be cleared up, and mushrooms seem to do that psychically so well that I could imagine they do a lot of the same in the body and. And, but I know very little about, um, I know that mushrooms work. I know that they're not, I know that they're safe, even though if you take too much, it can be scary. Um, I mean, it can be life-changing, you know, too. I mean, a macro dose of mushrooms can, you know, there's a lot of research coming out now about the effects of PTSD, chronic depression, taking Mm -hmm. macro doses. I think you're right though, as a formulator to be very cautious um, because macro doses should be taken, I think, under guidance, you know, if we're really going to approach this as medicine. Okay. So dabbling in the micro dose world is kind of a fun area, but of course people could take multiple micro doses and turn it into a macro dose. So there's always the potential of people abusing it or not using it the way that the formulator or manufacturer intended. Um, where is California at right now? with mushrooms, Oregon has legalized. Um, where Do you know where we're at regulatory speaking in California with psilocybin? Uh, there's a bill floating now for decriminalization. And I'm not, I think it lays out an intention to discuss what legalization looks like, but there's no structure or time attached to that. Um, we have cities that have See, when you say legalization, there's like an implication of commercialization. And that right. is that's not um, what we're talking about with mushrooms. It's still very, very, very much a felony in California to, to transport mushrooms from one county to the next county with any intention of selling them. Mm. Um, that's very much not allowed. And so it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Um, Even a microdose product, any amount. Of, yeah. yeah. Right. So I sell mushrooms um i give them away to people sure yep yep <clears throat> yeah um yeah it's kind of an interesting space because you know the, you know they're going to drag their feet i think and california will be very slow unfortunately i think to pick this up you know if a place was- like 
like cannabis, it's going to be a fucking nightmare. So here's the difference. Exactly. Here's the difference. So my buddy just came down from Oregon and he brought some weed with them from a dispensary. And it still looks like the old days. Like it was in one of those green plastic pop top. It's got like a white Avery label that like that there's no branding, you know, then you come down to California and it says everything's branded. Of course, yeah. you know, it's everything's cookies and gelato. And it, if mushrooms happen in California, the same thing will happen. It'll just become this like recreational, you know, free for all, which I actually am in totally in favor of, but I think it's appropriate to scale that up, you know, and to start with like the real, we have to kind of approach it the same way we've approached cannabis, you know, medical first, you know, get people on board that this is important, that this really helps people. Once we kind of get the consensus on that and then we go, okay, let's, let's start kind of, allowing a little bit more exchange to happen you know outside of just a really scripted medical environment um because i think the world needs this medicine right now like we we do need um mushrooms they're an incredibly powerful um uh, healing sacred plant and um yeah. lord lord knows we need it right now because the whole world's going crazy and <laughs> you know it's association of like shamans herbalists right. mm -hmm. with like a professional association like the american medical association except just a bunch of heads mm -hmm. right right <laughs> but i i think there's an alternate framework for legalization that still does all the safety things that the state needs without all the commercialization and corporate bullshit that mm -hmm. don't actually want like uh, think about someone who's certified in physical therapy. Maybe similar to that, you can get certified in entheogens and herbs. And it, it would be like a license. You would apprentice with a master. You would earn a license. You would have to renew it to continue education. But then you could be like a mobile, you could be a drug dealer with a license and an education that proves that, you know, you know how to properly take care of your clientele. Right. Right. That would, that would be way cooler. Yeah. I, I could, yeah. I could see oh. some, I could see some type of model piggybacking on medical cannabis where, you know, maybe, maybe just the medical dispensaries can also sell mushrooms, but that dispensary has to have like a licensed mushroom professional shaman that has a 20 minute consultation with every new patient buying psychedelic mushroom products, something like that. Um, so it, that there's some safety concerns taken care of. You can learn, you can learn about like drug interactions. That right. would be important. Absolutely. It really bugs me that a dispensary can have a medical license, right? But don't you fucking dare talk about using cannabis medicinally to someone that's don't make any claims. Right. Don't. I, yeah. It, no, it, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't but make any sense. Yeah. It's very confusing. It's confusing it, to people. People who do have the background in the medicine side don't have the cannabis education, aren't allowed to cross over their practices. It's not like, it's not like you can go to a doctor and walk out with a prescription for Vicodin and a topical. Right. Right. Which is dumb. It is dumb. No, I think doctors need to have every tool available to them. You know, I think, I think that's what we're saying in this industry is, you know, Hey, this is real medicine and it should be available to people who need it. It's not for everyone. It's not going to help with every thing under the sun, but it can sure help with a lot of conditions. People don't need to be suffering as much as they are. There are plant, there's plant medicine that can help and let's, you know, I don't know what it is. You know, I, I'm going to ask the same question to every guest that I have on head change of why cannabis is still illegal in 2021. I mean, there's this cacophony of conspiracies that seem to create that. What, what's your take on the forces that keep, you know, this plant and all the sacred plants, you know, under their thumb, you know, who is it? How do we change it? Is it worth it? Is it a losing battle? What are we up against? I think in 50 years, we'll laugh at this shit. Mm -hmm. We'll laugh at 
he ever took these things so seriously. And I think that's just the desensitization that comes with time. Like we're dealing with these arduous as fuck regulations now, but you and I know, and I'm sure everybody at the BCC knows how fucking unnecessary it all is because this shit is safe and effective and everybody uses it. Your 14 year old got it from his friend at school. Like they're not buying it at the dispensary. Like weed is everywhere and always has been. <laughs> right. Uh, and I really think that it was political. Like we know for a fact that when it was made illegal, that that was a political move meant to suppress the anti-war movement for Vietnam. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's that's quotable fact. You're talking about Nixon's yeah night making you know the, the war on drugs really the official yeah. launch of the war on drugs. Yeah, because they had no other way to criminalize these you know liberal arts white kids from wealthy households. So how do you stop them from protesting? Arrest them for drugs. You know, slap. Yeah. How- how do you keep them from impacting the culture with their vote? Slap them with a felony for drugs. How do you yep. ruin them? How do you keep them out of the corporate structure? Keep them from having, you know, executive seats and board seats. So how do you ice people with good intentions out of a marketplace that can't tolerate people with good intentions? Slap them with a felony. And it worked really well. And... <laughs> And in some ways, how our forebears went about trying to get weed uncriminalized just played into it. You know, going to going to protests and being loud and having thousand people spark up a joint on a lawn in front of a Capitol building, like that really just helped their narrative. Right. It didn't help. And I'm not. I'm not dissing them at all. Like fucking respect. I was brave. Um, but in hindsight, I don't think it helped. Right. Think played it into just, the culture war. It played into the culture war and it, <laughs> it stigmatized. It, it helped them to stigmatize anybody who would even think about using it. And that's a lot to overcome, especially since the people who helped vote for that shit are still goddamn alive. Right running our right and cannabis has always been attached to mexicans black people arabs like all these super targets you know whatever they it to Mm -hmm. it really has just been a political football and now the only thing that's changed is they're done using it as a political football to to criminalize people and now they use it as one to make their friends wealthy that's like yeah it's it's disgusting you know it, it, it makes your stomach turn when you really know the history of the plant fuck a 12 foot schlong that mother <laughs> this just got an explicit warning i love it no it's true though um yeah i mean no you're you're right i mean the politics of it and especially with who's in office right now and you'll get biden and kamala and and they've been on the wrong side of this debate but now the political winds have shifted and so now it's you know um now we know everyone's woke on cannabis now you know republicans democrats everyone's woke i think that cannabis has the potential to crack the nut and this is my theory on why we continue to repress it so hardcore it's because if people realize that they were lied to about this plant they're going to start questioning other things too and so all of the control begins to un- unravel pretty quickly and like cannabis is like a linchpin of unraveling all of the propaganda that you know we've been fed um, i think that's what kind of scares people as it it's expansive it gets people thinking for themselves it gets people thinking um, outside of the box it actually unites people it's not a divisive thing other than politically it's 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 weaponized but actually cannabis actually unites people 
like people on all sides of the political spectrum actually enjoy weed. Rednecks love weed. Hippies love weed. You know, it, it's something that like the deepest redneck and the most super hippie could actually come together and like share a joint and totally be friends. It's like probably the only thing they could be friends over. Um, so I like, that's why I like the scene. I like the culture that surrounds cannabis. I like the diversity. I like the potential, you know, people that aren't a part of like the cannabis culture, maybe don't feel like they belong. Like, come on in. It's like a dead show, you know? And like, I used to, I used to hate the Grateful Dead until I actually went to a dead show. I was like a punk. I was in like punk bands and thought I was too cool for the dead. And then I went and like on mushrooms and I was like, oh, now I get it. I was like, yeah, the music is way better on mushrooms, first of all. (laughs) And the people are really cool. Like the people are really nice. They're friendly. They're open-minded. And that's like, to me, the cannabis industry, people are really cool. Like, don't judge it until you try it. Like, come on in, you know, like, see what's up. Uh, Stoners are fucking rad people. Um, so the, the culture kind of gets lost too, right. With like the whitewashing and corporatizing of, of cannabis. And, um, I know not everybody wants to wear a tie dye, but like, we can't, we, we don't want to like lose the culture that surrounds it because it's a culture of unity and acceptance. And like, if you're, if you're a smoker, it's like no judgments, you know, it's just like, come on into the circle. Like we're all friends now. Like most of the friends I've made in the last 20 years have been around cannabis, you know, like those are like my deepest connections because I think it just, it taps us into something, you know, deep and something sacred. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about another thing that I just think will be, you know, good to hear. Like, okay. I'm like a white cis born, you know, guy and the cannabis industry is just kicking my ass. It's super hard as a female and minority owned company access to institutionalized funding and knowledge is incredibly difficult, even as a white guy, because I didn't go to Princeton and Harvard and I just don't rub elbows with that institutionalized capital. As a minority female owned brand, you probably even have less access to it. Um, And I know there's a big movement in the space to try to prop up, you know, minority owned brands and female owned brands, but because I'm not really involved in that, is it doing enough you know, like, is it just a bunch of bullshit or is there real work being done? You know, what's your, what's your opinion on that? It's a bunch of bullshit. <clears throat> what it seems know, like, yeah. I know actually one city with a program that's workable and I know of two people with licenses in that city who are doing something good with it. And that's it for the whole state mm-hmm. of California. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it seems like the social equity thing was was a joke in California. It seems like maybe New York is trying to do it right. Are you following what New York's doing at all? Uh, No, I haven't, but I was going to say, because I'm in Sacramento, Sacramento just, just granted, just awarded their social equity licenses. How many years after? How many years after? They just awarded them multiple of the people, the quote unquote equity applicants that received licenses already have licenses and dispensaries like these are not people who (laughs) who need it right they're not the ones that need it they're people who are piggybacking on a program like i don't want to get too into it but it's infuriating yeah yeah no i can imagine um i mean that that's like that's some real shit though because this isn't a joke, you know, people, people, people have been getting, uh, preyed upon and locked up over this commodity, you know, this booming industry. And like, I think we have to get this right, you know, like in order for the cannabis industry to operate in its full capacity as a healthy, thriving industry, I think we have to get this right. We have to acknowledge that people were treated poorly and they deserve some type of um, equity, you know, in the space that that's not just to make politicians feel better and have a nice stump speech, but that really works. And I don't have the answers. I'm just trying to ask the questions. But an option where they can just get cash. Cause here's the problem. Let's say that you were a, a neighborhood weed dealer and you got popped and you did time, and now you qualify for social equity. You may not be at a place in your life or have the other skills 
to start and run a business like being a neighborhood weed dealer does not equal entrepreneur and it does mm. like and that's not a diss it's just not a life for a lot of people like not everybody wants that and saying that that's the only way that you can get any kind of you know restitution for what you've been through is if you if you start and run a business and then the programs usually additionally stipulate that you have to partner with an additional with a current license holder um <clears throat> Now you have to have contract and business negotiation skills. You need to hire lawyers. It's, it's arduous. And maybe at the end of all of that pain and suffering, years later, you might make a profit on your business. Right. How about just cash? Yeah. I'm all, I'm all for reparations <laughs> as far as that goes. How about if somebody is not trying to run a fucking weed business now in today's climate, we just pay them for their pain and suffering? Yeah. I mean, in terms of what's actually fair, I mean, it's probably pretty fair. And, you know, until you've really been on that end of the stick, I think it's hard to really understand. You know, I've told this story before, but I was on a Greyhound bus with a woman going through uh, Tennessee and I got caught with weed in Memphis, Tennessee, because they they were they searched everyone's bags. It was crazy. And of course I had weed on me. And I got called into like the Greyhound station and I just talked to my way out of it. I was like, oh, I've got a medical license. And you know, let me like call my dad, my attorney. And then they were just like, okay, whatever, we don't want to deal with this white boy. I just like totally lied and like I don't have an attorney, you know. <laughs> But there it is. Like I just knew I I leveraged my whiteness like straight up, and got on the bus. And this I sat next to this black woman, and she was like, "Did they take your weed?" And I was like, "No." And she was like, "Let's smoke it at the next stop." And I was like, "Hell yeah!" So I smoked a joint with this with this black woman who told me that she had been locked up for three years in Arkansas for having less weed than I had on me, and she had a newborn baby Jeez. at the time. And that's when it like really clicked. I was like, "Okay, wow, this is this is modern Jim Crow." Um, and yeah, what, what heals that suffering, taking a mother away from her infant uh, for three years, you know, what, how do you, how do you really like heal that? You know, I, I don't think you can, but you can certainly try. Um, and I think we should. Um, but uh, um, anyway, heavy stuff there. And, and, um, and I know, <laughs> You know, but it's like there there is a greater cause here, you know, and like, I, I guess my point is it's easy for a lot of people to look at the cannabis industry in terms of dollars and cents and just think about it as an investment. But it's like, even from a business perspective, I think it's important to get this issue right. And like, that's how I think the industry will actually thrive and be inclusive and, and ultimately just have better products and better businesses. Like, I love the idea of not just giving money, but like, instead of just giving licenses to minority communities, why don't, um, why don't we give them the resources to become better business people? Like, you know, let, let's have an MBA program, you know, in the, in these community, let's, let's do all the handholding we need to do to create long-term wealth, you know, in communities that have been fucked by the police and by regulations. That, that's what I would like to see is sure. Give people checks. I'm all for that and invest in their communities you invest in their schools help people get a path out of poverty and out of um you know the situation they're in um i think i think you you'll get more people on board with that type of thing and then you kind of slip into the legislation and they get a check for you know two hundred thousand or whatever you know be kind of like you lead with the let's help people pull themselves up by their bootstraps you know and, and do all never that. Have to pay taxes again ever mm -hmm, sure <laughs> right. you're just just immune to state income taxes for the rest of forever how about that right yeah yeah that might de-incentivize the government for locking so many people up because right now there's a real perverse incentive um let's talk a little bit more about formulating sure um so i know you use cbda and thca the raw um cannabinoids for your topicals 
do you do you use i know you have some products that have cbd and thc in them as well though right you're not just 100 percent raw or are you 100 percent raw okay all right all right most of when i do for clients work pretty much none of them want raw sure harder for sure. them to sure they maximum milligramage <laughs> yeah like i don't care and i'll be like it doesn't make it any better i don't care it looks good on the label okay yep yep that's what i found too is that in my formulations like when i was formulating the product to work and i wasn't lab testing it and then i finally lab tested my formula that i was like well i know this product works for for my neck pain and everyone else tells me it works great it wasn't that strong it's like Nope. My, my 50 ml jar of balm has like 75 milligrams, you know, yeah. in it, but they're all acidic primarily. They're, it's primarily totally THCA. Completely adequate for the job you're trying to do. But. Right. But I know the market wants to see 500 milligrams, you know, there's that constant and, and, you know, the, in the acidic cannabinoids, because of the lack of research does not allow the marketing teams to kind of bank on certain claims or at least have that backbone of research. And therefore, I think the enthusiasm in the industry has been kind of limited on the acidic cannabinoids, but I'm confident they'll eventually have their, their time. It might actually be in the pharmaceutical space though, that the acids really thrive mm -hmm. because the pharmaceutical industry will do the research and realize, oh, you know, we actually have these compounds that are unstable. We can learn how to synthesize them and stabilize them. Like, you know, Raphael Machulam's doing with his, uh, whatever he's calling his CBDA isolate. That's where I think we'll see the acids actually be put to use more in the in the plant-based side, just because people are, it's like that drug culture, stoner culture of you have to heat the plant to activate it, to get the benefit from it that, you know, people are associating with this, you know, and they're like, why would I use the raw plant? It doesn't do anything. And it's like, well, sure. If you're trying to get high, definitely don't take THCA. You're going to be very disappointed. But if you're trying to regulate an autoimmune disorder, THCA is a miracle, you know, um, ingredient. So I think, I think the acids are always going to struggle. I struggle with this, with my product line. Cause it's like, I've, you know, I've always been a champion of these raw formulations. Cause I know they work, but the market just like, isn't quite there yet you know it's like we're like five years ahead of our time you know with these formulas if, if we're if we're gonna <laughs> we want to talk about acids maybe we should use acid to market our acids <laughs> right <laughs> i mean a basic a topicals line called acid with all the psychedelic trippy packaging all that maybe that's the pathway <laughs> yeah i've thought about that actually um it's kind of embracing the acid component you know it, um it's kind of it, but, yeah right. i've it recently worked. had that idea so we're we're sharing we're sharing that psychedelic wavelength um, yeah but he has yeah that's their own so are you also making CBD products for the national market? You said you formulated one, but you're not selling any of your own branded. I formulated, I did a lotion and a massage oil and a face cream. And I've done a lot of formulations for that market, tinctures, gummies, mm -hmm. but I don't. And that would just be another thing on my list of things to stay on top of and yeah. don't be. Yep. 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 No, I think, I think, I think it's good to, to hone your talents and, um, you know, you know, like I said, your ability as a formulator is amazing. I mean, if I was launching a product into this space, I would definitely recommend you and Newell to kind of bring people up to speed on what's going to work, you know, and, you know, the combination of, of plants and ingredients is so key, you know, formula really matters. You know, I, I, I always emphasize when I do bud tender trainings and all these things, it's like, don't just look at how many milligrams of THC or CBD are in this product. Look at the other ingredients. What's the base oil? You know, what is, what's the essential oil blend? What are the complementary herbs, if any, 
you know, and most topicals fall into like your basic balm category where it's like coconut oil, beeswax, some eucalyptus peppermint, like your real classic, you know, Papa and Barkley formula. And then like advanced formulas that actually have like complementary herbs weren't just like calculated by a CFO to make sure the margins, you know, are going to work at scale, but we're just formulated to work, you know, without any of that being considered, which is kind of like the school we're coming from. And I think our, I think if people understood that story, a lot of customers would choose the, you know, they want the product that was made to be the best without any consideration. Like that's how Samuel Adams markets their beer. Did you know that? Like that's their big marketing campaign is we're stupid business people. We put the best hops in the, and they don't, of course, but they, they, they like say like, we put the most expensive barley in our beer. It doesn't even make any sense. Our, all of our investors hate it, but we do it because we're so committed to like, they literally do like look up some Santa Adams uh, marketing. It's a really good marketing campaign. And I think that could kind of work too for like us craft people where it's like, we're putting the best ingredients into this product. It's like, it's crazy the deal that you're getting. Cause it really is. If you, if you compare value to value with a lot of products on the shelf, when you have just add distillate to pre-made lotion bases versus a product really formulated, like from scratch, you know, with thoughtful consideration, it, the value difference is severe. And I think if, if we can do a better job of telling that story and getting that in front of people, I, I think we have a fighting chance on the craft space. I'm, I'm not, throwing my hat in yet i just think we have to really market and brand and network and and help each other out as much as possible but it's just it's a difficult time right now to be in the california cannabis space it's if you're a small to medium operator um it's a very challenging time right now um so anybody listening like if you're in that if you're in that space with us like let's link up you know let's connect you know because we need yeah. each other advice to people is um do as little as possible and what i mean by that is if you want to launch a, a cannabis brand don't even think about trying to get your own license or your own property or your own none of that those are just massive expenses you don't need that other people have already paid and they desperately need to recoup their expenses right <laughs> like when we manufacture, I pay by the day. Uh, and I just rent that space from somebody, you know, essentially borrow their license. It's all, it's all buttoned up and legal. You know, I have a badge and I'm officially a volunteer employee. <laughs> yep. but, uh, <clears throat> don't, I mean, I manufacture twice a year. Mm -hmm. I need to have my own space and license for that. That's absurd. Right. I think a lot of people have come to that conclusion. You don't need to spend 30 grand on, on a brand design and like do as little as possible. Work with the money that you have on hand. Um, yeah, I don't, I look at Pop and Barkley that just lost money and lost money and lost money until they pivoted into Raza. And now they're probably maybe breaking even now. Yeah, their Papa Select has probably done really well. That's a, that was a good move. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that you don't need a license to actually launch a brand in the space. And this is like one of those like little secrets, you know, of, of doing the, the, the brand um, licensing structure and, yeah. um, but that's not enough. If I, if I didn't already know everybody in cannabis, I would be screwed. Right. Right. <laughs> If I didn't have those relationships already, yep. they're hard to find. There they are. They're yep. I think it's like for, for people in kind of in our position, like we're so product focused and like we care so much about, you know, the quality of the flower and the quality of the product and that it, that it's efficacious and that it's as advertised that sometimes like the the marketing and sell through plan gets overlooked and it's just kind of like we're coming from that old school position of like if you build it they will come and i think a lot of people in the cannabis space have kind of done that it's like if i just get the license if i just open up my dispensary like it'll all work out and i think a lot of people are feel are realizing that it's not going to work like unfortunately we need the suits 
We do need the business people, but they need us just as much. And I'm hoping for some alliances to form with people like us, with really savvy, thoughtful, engaged business people that know how to scale. And if we can kind of come together, there is so much talent in California and so much wisdom and knowledge that if I was an investor, you know, listening to this, or if I'm just, because a smart investor knows cannabis is going to be huge. I mean, it's, it will get in, it, there's money to be made, right? But are you going to enter the space and just blindly, or are you going to reach out to the people that helped really build it? And I hope that they do. And I think the brands that actually do that, that kind of have that balance of business savvy and cannabis savvy are going to do pretty well. And I think Pop and Barkley is one of those brands as much as I hate them. And if you guys are listening, I love you, but I hate you because you dominate the space, but they do have a pretty good balance. You know, if you look at their structure, you know, and maybe it's, maybe it's made up, but you know, they seem to have one foot firmly in business world, one foot firmly in cannabis humble world, and they're doing it pretty well, you know, and I, I don't know what their balance sheet looks like, you know, but they seem to be, you know, if I'm going to look at Cal the California space and say, Levi, name a couple brands that you see have really kicked ass. I'm going to say Cookies, Papa and Barkley, you know, maybe, I don't know, 710 Labs, you know, seems to be doing some cool yes. shit. You know, there's some brands that I, I am seeing to really start to separate, you know, mm -hmm. Cannabiotics, you know, that flower has done exceptionally well because it, it's, it's, it's the same, it's consistent, you know. Uh, what are some brands that you're like excited about in the space that that you would uh, point to with big farms <laughs> and like and that's a hella funny thing to say because i'm normally the fuck indoor person you said fig farms yeah 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 that, mm -hmm, yep they, they put out fire weed so mm -hmm. uh so i was i was bu a buyer for um for delivery service in sacramento for like a few months um <clears throat> and so i got to see a lot of weed and a lot of it's just hype like the cookies flower that comes in is meh and connected is good but i've definitely seen better especially at the price like for their yeah. after taxes in sacramento they go out the door for like 95 dollars an eighth yeah that's tourist which, weed to me which, you know <laughs> which makes the fig farms at 72 seem like a good deal but when you crack open the jars there's just no comparison like connected you have these over manicured round little nugs that to me i think the cure is bad i think they're always over dried that's an opinion other people mm -hmm. do with me um you pull up in the the fake farms i should bust one out right now <laughs> uh yeah, and it's do. these stacked colas with huge bracts and minimally processed you can tell no one fucking touched this bud like they yeah. went in a pair of tweezers and pulled the leaf out you know it's perfect um and it's fire like yeah 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 no I, i've been impressed with fig farms for sure fig farms and cannabiotics are probably in my opinion the two best indoor uh flowers on the market that i've seen um consistently So yeah, my former employer gave me this as a birthday present. Nice. What's the genetics on that? Something wreck? A moonana wreck. It's banana figs crossed with moon drops 103. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. THC is 30%. Right. Fig Farms is out of Oakland, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. O Oakland, Oakland grows dank. I mean, Oakland knows what's up. There's a couple of regions like even though it's hard to say like indoor has terroir there is because every kind of region in California that has an indoor culture does grow it a little different, you know, like the Bay area indoor is a little different from San Fernando Valley indoor and Santa, you know, Santa Rosa or San Diego. Yeah. That looks bomb. Yeah. There, there's a lot of strains coming out right now that are just all look and no delivery. Like Sunday driver for me is one of those like um, looks amazing never delivers you know um just kind of these show show off you know strains i still really enjoy 
the old sours, you know, like OG and sour diesel and just like those really limonene, and piney and heavy slap you across the face, you know, Cali OGs. I still just like, will always have such a soft spot for those because they always just take me where I want to go. Like they hit, um, but there's a lot of cool, you know, designer strains out of the market. And I think that's all fun. Like I I'm all, I'm all about it, but I think, yeah, $90 out the door. I mean, if people want to buy connected for that, like, you know, I, I've tried the gel and the gushers and it is, it is good flower. Um, but it's not worth that in my opinion, but if they, if, but the brand might be, you know, like I said, that's the tourist weed. Like people come here and they want to, they've heard about it, you know, they, they, they want to go to the connected store, the cookie store, and feel like they're a part of that culture. You know, they're buying into something deeper than just that flower. You know, they're buying into the culture. The, the difference between Fig Farms and Connected and Cookies is Connected and Cookies are brands. They source, they have their own licenses, but they also source a lot of flour from contractors, mm-hmm. um, which means depending on the skill of the contractor, you might get a totally different product in. Right. One. Quality control is going to be limited. Yep. Whereas Fig Farms, is, it's one location, one license. It's a building in Oakland. Everything's in you know, yeah. if they start outsourcing, I prop they would probably drop on my list, like just naturally. Uh, yeah. Just how, uh, I, when when I was talking to like customers at the delivery, and they did not already have a bias towards a brand, I would always push them towards farms, not brands. Right. Yeah. So yep. You know, I'd be. I have this from this brand, but that doesn't matter. It's coming off of, you know, Moongazer Farm out of Yolo County. This is a woman. I would tell them about the farm. Like, yeah. And I think that's what matters. That's, it, it is what matters. That's what matters to me, too, because I want to smoke really good weed. <laughs> you know, like, like literally at the end of the day, I'm just a selfish consumer. I just want really good flour. Um, I do like outdoor better than indoor, you know, and, and I smoke both. I, I love to get the super frosty indoor, the fig farm stuff. Like that's fun weed to smoke, but I get higher, I get higher and I get a, a better effect from sun grown. And um, some of my favorite sun grown farms, you know, I've been getting some good stuff from farmer and felon actually, like they're pretty consistent, but of course, green shock is fire. Uh, Coastal sun, I think is doing a good job out of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz has some really cool terroir. Yeah. Um, that's a micro kind of world there that doesn't get talked about enough, but I've some of the best weed I've ever smoked in my life has come out of Santa Cruz, you know, Nevada city um, has some amazing flower, but are there any, um, you know, I know you mentioned a couple, but are there any outdoor farms that have caught in your attention? Uh, I'm heavily biased, right? If I'm not smoking my own sun grown weed, Mm -hmm. I don't mind Mark's weed. Um, Right. Yeah. That's where my list ends. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I know when you're friends with uh with Mark Grayshock and Jeannie and those those that crew, it, it's hard to smoke anything else. They have ruined my palate. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to smoke anybody else's shit. Not when mm-hmm. I have place not to. Yeah, yeah. No, if 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 anybody's never tried my- green green shock, give them a try. <laughs> yes, get green shock farms. I don't even who is destroying for them now. Do you even know? It, uh, you know, I just had, um, someone from them on the show, I should ask, but I, I want to say, weren't they, what was the, they're going through somebody out of Oakland, I think. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, cause that, like that when vape I was, company yeah, I never came in on a menu. Like, uh-huh. No one's actually out there pushing it, but I know it's, it's hard to find their flower. Yep. Yeah. Really I've seen it. Right. South in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. And then when I came back. <laughs> yeah. It's because they haven't budged on their pricing. They're like, people want a low ball outdoor flower and then give you, you know, ridiculously low amounts for it. And it's like, they just haven't budged. And I, I respect them for that. I, I hope they win that debate because I would any day of the week choose a $30 eighth of really good sun ground over the $55 indoor, like any day of the week. It's just, it's a better value. Like as, as a smoker, like the indoor might look a little prettier, maybe. Um, but in terms of effect and value, I think you're just, you're getting a much better value from, 
from the sun grown and and the sun grown is more scalable too and i think california does have a unique climate some of the santa barbara farms are kind of actually impressing me i mean i know local cannabis won first place overall best in show for their ice cream cake i tried some of it recently it was great um I think some of those cake strains are a little overrated, but I enjoy them. They're cool. Like they're, they're like easy riders, you know, they're just like, you know, a lot of beta carry off lean myrosine. They're just kind of like fun, easy going strains, you know, very like crowd pleasing. Um, but local cannabis is pretty good. Josh D, you know, Santa Barbara, I think has more canopy than anywhere in California now, you know, that's going to be, I think along with the Emerald Triangle, the other massive hub of sun grown. And it's all greenhouse there in Santa Barbara. I think it has to be greenhouse um, in Santa Barbara. I'm going to Santa Barbara next weekend and I'm going to go into Ojai, but I'm going to go and buy a bunch of local cannabis and any of the local Santa Barbara farms I can find. Cause I'm, I've, I've always thought that light depth mixed light model is where commercial cannabis is going to go. You know, that's the scalable you know, that's how they do it in the Netherlands with, with, you know, ornamental flowers and stuff that light depth supplemented with LEDs, you know, or whatever. Um, but some cool cannabis coming out of Santa Barbara too. That's kind of the other thing that's on my radar, um, um, right now, but, um, yeah, yeah. The, the space is evolving. It's, a uh, you know, I talked to Cam from Fiddler's Greens and, you know, I'm trying to bring all my friends on the show just to kind of, you know, rally support and let people know, you know, get some faces to the people in this space and the people that have really, I think, helped define, you know, the categories and, and you and Newell have certainly, I think, um, helped define the cannabis topical space unquestionably um, and have made major contributions. So um, can anybody find your products? Do you have any out there that people can buy if they're interested? Uh, predominantly in Modesto, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. Well, not a lot of places. Uh, Napa, Napa's got it. So people in Modesto and Napa go and buy Newell's Botanicals, Topicals, unbelievable stuff. Um, and what are you growing right now? Do you got some plants in the garden? Get it anywhere in and around Sacramento directly from my website because I fulfill through a delivery service. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. What's your website, Chelsea? Your door, uh, Newell'sBotanicals.com. Okay. I'll put that in the link on the show. Great. Um, what are you growing in your backyard right now? Uh, volunteers. Whatever. So I always breed a little bit every year. And just depending on, you know, my frame of mind, sometimes the pollen gets a little more spread. Sometimes it gets a little less spread. Last year was a more spread year which I don't care. I'm not selling it. I'm smoking it. I don't care if it's got beans in it. I'm going to sure. take awesome yep. in the yard. <laughs> um, but I ended up with just like a ton of seeded weed this last year. And on some of the plants, when it goes to seed, it dies. Hmm. And so I had branches that turned brown. And so they just got chopped and dropped right on the ground. And then come you know, rainy season, I've got about 300 little baby weed plants out in the yard. Um, so I let them get a little bit tall before I unleash the chickens on them. And so the chickens pruned and thinned. And now I've got like eight, 10 big ass plants. Nice. Big ass. And you know, I think there's really something special about the volunteers too. And like, I've I loved it. Yep. I it's like, preferred plants they and like in talking to like mark grayshock about that some of his best genetics have come from volunteers you know like there's nothing more natural than that like those seeds actually went through the natural process they fell from the plant onto the ground they froze in the winter they did the whole germination thing like they're they are really connected to that environment on a deeper level than even a seed that you grew there but stored in a ziploc baggie in your cupboard for nine months like when the, when the seed is actually a part of the natural cycle, um, there's kind of something magical about it. And I know, I know like growers that are really tapped in kind of like they're there. Anytime there's a volunteer, it's like this kind of gift, you know, and it's like, Ooh, you know, exciting, let, the mystery, you know, let's see what comes out of it. Um, so that's pretty cool. Well, keep growing, keep formulating, um, you know, keep doing what you do. Um, it, really, and 
yeah, it's great talking to you. Thanks for joining me today on Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I've been your host, Levi Strom. Full transcripts of today's episode are available on our blog at awakeneveryday.com. If you'd like to listen to more podcasts like this, you can join the conversation on Anchor FM and YouTube. Until next time, peace.